All right, so I'm standing in between everyone and a coffee break, so I'll try to go quickly and not, uh, not speak too fast, hopefully. Thank you again, um, uh, Faj, for inviting me and taking good care of me as well. I'm, I'm an industry person. I work for Intuitive Surgical. So um, Faj mentioned talking more about the business aspects would be more interesting to this audience. But I want to talk about commercialization and speaking about um, what makes things uh, successful and translatable. So hopefully you'll find it interesting. And I like it to be interactive, so please ask questions as, as we go along if things don't make sense. Um, I, I was driving to San Francisco the other day, and I find this guy. He's swerving into my lane, almost hits me. I yell something that I probably shouldn't say here. And I had a nice time yesterday going for a beautiful jog near the Biosciences uh, Center here. And in Leiden, I almost got hit by a woman uh, doing the same thing on her bicycle. So. Uh, it's nice to see more bikes here than anything else. So I want to talk about successes and failures of commercialization. And, um, you know, being involved with Intuitive, I can use Intuitive as some examples of this, but also some other companies in the biotechnology medical device space because I realize there's a, a variety of interests here uh, in this room. So hopefully you'll find it interesting. I have a very fun job, um, and a lot of us have the same kind of a job. We get to play with a lot of cool technologies. Uh, we have to worry about what is publishable, or most of you have to worry about what is publishable. Uh, for careers, we have to worry about what is fundable to be able to continue doing our research, both in industry as well as in academia. Um, but ultimately, we're all really interested in what is clinically useful, what fits into the workflow, and um, what is sustainable. Uh, we do have to make money doing these things, either via grants or from commercial sales. And this is the hardest thing. So finding what is at the intersection of these Venn diagrams. And this is what we all have to do uh, working together in academia and industry, is figuring out what we can do that actually makes a clinical difference and we can, we can commercialize. So what is success? I want to ask you guys. And if no one volunteers, I'm going to call on the very few people I know here. So what do you guys think of as being successful in this space? Anybody? Not all at once. Getting published. Helping, one patient. helping one patient? Yeah, helping patients. That's good. Something up there I heard? Do novel things. Sorry? Do novel things. Do novel things. So novel, interesting Invent. things. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Marr? Okay. Be content. Be content. Be happy. That's good. Anyone else? No, the, I was trying to think as well what makes me happy and similar to things. Helping a patient. Helping a surgeon, if we're in this forum. Helping the healthcare system. Getting grants, getting papers. Creating jobs. You know, my company actually is the result of government grants from the U.S. Now we have over 3,000 employees. When we go to the NIH and say, give people money, we say, look, it actually creates jobs, so it, it helps people. Being happy is a, a good answer. And making money. We, we, you know, we have to make money. Uh, some people like making a lot of money. Do you know who this is? Elon Musk. What is he famous for? PayPal, Tesla, yeah. He made his billions of dollars in PayPal, and then it enabled him to do Tesla, and enabled him to do SpaceX. So when you make money, you can do more interesting things. So we have to make money to do things somehow. So you know, success from a company point of view, I, I was talking to actually uh, someone uh, from Intuitive and who had a background from Ethicon, Johnson & Johnson, and I don't know if you know the history of sutures and wound closure, but back you know, thousands of years ago they used vegetation, people used linen, pig whiskers were the first monofilament suture used to close wounds, uh, black ants they still use in parts of South America and Africa to actually close wounds, you know, Lister, Listerine, uh, father of antiseptic techniques, postulated that silk and wax threads were actually irritating vasculature, and so he recommended cat gut, and then cat gut became the, the bioresorbable suture used around the world. And Ethicon, uh, what would become Ethicon in Scotland, was you know, making 30, 000, using 30,000 sheep a day to make cat gut. Uh, Ethicon had a majority of the suture market. And then these bioresorbable sutures, people started doing research, and Ethicon spent probably millions of dollars, I'm not sure how much they spent, to develop Vicryl. And they retained a majority of the suture market. So they didn't make more money, but they prevented themselves from losing money. So this can also be a success. You don't always have to, to, to make more. Our own company started, actually it's our 20th anniversary this year. Um, about 570,000 of these robotically assisted procedures were done last year. And it was an interesting year. You know, things slowed down in the US, but fortunately they, they, they were growing more in Europe and in Asia. 30% uh, of the, the revenues that we had, the sales we had, came from international sales. Uh, a, a little over 3,300 of these robots, hopefully you get a chance to play with one of these during the coffee breaks and the demo sessions, are uh, around, uh, around the world. And there are a bunch of different FDA clearances, which uh, I'll talk more about. So we, from a business perspective, it's, <coughs> excuse me, it's very interesting. We sell a robot 
which on average sells for a million and a half dollars. And we also have these reusable disposable instruments. It's a razor razor blade model when it comes to you know, kind of business speak, which is very interesting because in, uh, in the US, the Affordable Care Act has limited what certain hospitals are purchasing. So when the sales of these robots slow down, as long as people are doing procedures, we actually still can fund our operations. So it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, a traditional business model. In the 90s, there were a lot of companies working in the minimally invasive surgery space, mostly trying to reduce uh, open chest bypasses. You can see, obviously, a very large thoracotomy versus a minimally invasive uh, technique. Uh, the, the idea is this is good for patients. So if it's good for patients, then there'll be business. So Hartport Cardiothoracic Systems and Intuitive were kind of three companies working in this space. And if you look at what happened to Hartport, they were acquired by Johnson & Johnson. Uh, back in 2001 uh, for $81 million. Is it successful? Yes, they were acquired. They had a product out. You know, they, if you look at the numbers, they, they raised $20 million in venture capital, which probably would thrill anyone here. More importantly, they went public. They actually, a public offering, made a few of the founders millionaires. Uh, a lot of the employees became wealthy. They were acquired, and they continued having sales. So they made $20 million, roughly annual sales, up through 2007 when they were sold again to another company for $27 million. A success of sorts. Cardiothoracic Systems, they were purchased in 99 by Guidance for 300 some odd million dollars. Is this successful? Similar story. Similar amount of money raised, similar time. Uh, they were acquired in 1999 for $300 million. And uh, at that time, they had about $30 million of annual sales. Um, they actually wasn't a huge premium. If you owned stock when they were acquired, it didn't go up much because of um, dilution and things like this. But also another type of another type of success, transitioning to what what we do at Intuitive. Surgical robotics was <clears throat> was also alive and well in the 90s. Intuitive wasn't the first to even make a prostate surgery robot. That credit goes to uh, the people at Imperial College, led by Brian Davies. Um, they actually had a transurethral, or uh, sorry, not transurethral, but they had the probot, which did um, prostate resections, not full-on prostatectomies. Uh, it was autonomous, it was, it was image guided, you can see the ultrasound there. Um, it did not succeed commercially, but it was, it was around. Uh, Intuitive saw some interesting uh, DO, or DARPA, you know, US DOD type funding uh, projects from SRI, Stanford Research Institute in Menlo Park in the 90s, and they licensed it. You had uh, two people from a company called Accuson, which made ultrasound equipment before it was acquired by Siemens. And then you had a, a physician, Fred Moll, who was um, from Guidant. And they actually uh, spun this company off, and they started Intuitive. They, um, you know, so here's a picture of some of our engineers in the lab around those times. And they came out with their science project. This was the early Da Vinci. So if you're working in the lab and something doesn't look really cool, you know, imagine what it could be. You, know, it's, it, you don't, always, don't always have industrial designers involved from the get-go. Intuitive lost money for a while. You know, look at this. You know, if, if you're investing in a company like this, wow, that's you know, losing $70 million in the first three years. You have 100 employees. Things aren't going well. Uh, things really aren't going well. Um, but you look here, they started selling. So $70 million spent, sold, some, sold a system or two or three in Europe, and then got approval in the US, sold some more systems, sold some more systems. And you know, we're losing less money, but still losing a lot of money. So it's, it's scary when you start a company. Well, what happened? I don't know if people know this, this story, but if you look at it from a business perspective, you look at minimally invasive surgery, we think it's good for people, for patients, for, for the healthcare system. If you look at the percent of surgeries that were done back then minimally invasively, you have 100% here, 0%. Easier surgeries, cholecystectomies and the like, gallbladder removals, a larger number were done minimally invasively, laparoscopically. As you got down to cardiac, probably the hardest one to do, very few are done. This is where all these companies were, Hartport, Cardiothoracic Systems, Intuitive. Go after the cardiac market, you know, but listen to your customers. The customers weren't using it. So Intuitive almost went under a couple of times because they went after this cardiac market and it, it didn't work. So what did happen? Well, you know, prostatectomy. People, looking back, it's easy to say, well, prostate, it worked very well. It wasn't the target market. There was actually quite a bit of internal strife the first procedure actually was done in, uh, in Frankfurt, which uh, took over 11 hours, by no means a success, but it really saved the company. So you don't always know what's going to be commercially successful, but if you put the tools in the hands of your users, you learn quite a bit. So it really saved the company, and um, I kind of did odd years here, but 2013, quite a bit of sales, quite a bit of income, and now we have over 3,000 employees. So it's, it, it's a nice story. 
but the success was based on minimally invasive surgery. So doing this, and it wound up in the actual pelvis uh, with, uh, with prostate and uh, gynecology. And you can kind of see the, the percent of procedures. This is a conceptual diagram. Almost everything was done open, uh, a little bit lap. And then once this really started, uh, the procedures were done in 2000, 2001, followed by FDA approval. Really, you saw open and laparoscopic go down. Uh, these are US numbers. And then the Da Vinci really, really shot up. So it's really an interesting translation. Um, how to evaluate these interesting technologies. Uh, Dr. Mirror mentioned field of view issues with some of the SPECT imaging agents. This is another field of view issue. So this is uh, the confocal microendoscope cell visio by Mauna Kea in Paris. Uh, some work done uh, by Andrew Ragocek at City of Hope. Um, this is you know, a pig. This is holding one of their probes with our, our robotic instrument. And you can actually see blood cells after you administer fluorescein. Really fantastic microvasculature, but you have this field of view issue. It's you know, 100 microns by 100 microns. When you're operating on many centimeters by many centimeters, how do you know where to look? Similarly, you know, can anyone tell what this is from this field of view? Any guesses? Uh, no guesses. How about now? What's that? No, OK, no, no one who knows. OK, so it's a person, right? So now, now you see it's a person. It's a person on the beach, right? Face like going to the beach. Um, but now you can actually see as you, uh, as you increase your field of view, you know where you are. You, you don't really know that it's Faiz. You can kind of see it's, it's somebody. Maybe if you know his profile, you know it's him. But if we play with our camera angles, maybe, we can, uh, we can play with some from imaging parameters, and then we actually see who it is. We have some distortions at the bottom of his jacket. Not a big deal. We know how, how charismatic he is. But if you're looking for nerves, if you're looking for blood vessels, and we start doing too much image processing, you might mess up something that's very important. So, but now we know it's one of our co-organizers sitting at the beach in, in California. Um, I was, you know, I, I, this isn't really the fluorescence imaging session, but I wanted to talk about translation of fluorescence imaging technologies because we, we came out of the fluorescent system in, in 2011. You know, we have Stortz here, we have uh, Hamamatsu, you know, uh, Novadak makes fluorescent systems. So fluorescence is interesting for us, and we, we put it on our system to see what it would do, and really we thought it would be a platform for translation of a lot of these interesting things that we'll hear about tomorrow. But for us, for making uh, procedures safer, something very easy was looking at uh, the bile ducts and the triangle of Callot and the hepatobiliary system. And ICG is excreted this way normally. You dose it to a patient, and this is what you see an hour or two actually out to, to many hours later. But it wasn't FDA approved for this. So we actually had to spend quite a bit of resources to get this FDA approved. The regulatory process is something you really need to pay attention to as you become uh, you know, a growing company. Uh, it's, it's gotten you know, more, more difficult in, uh, in the last few years, but the, the advantage is there are a lot of people who know a lot about it, so you can work to do this. But the regulatory process is important in fluorescence, and I imagine many people will talk about it tomorrow. If you look at you know, a company like ours as an example, the number of procedures, you know, we, were a, we were, as I mentioned, a urology company. Here in orange, you have urology. This is gynecology, and then you have these uh, general surgeries slowly growing. Here, there's more gynecology than urology. So if we look, okay, well, we have, there are a lot of prostate surgeries done with uh, robotic assistance, but what are, the, what are the side effects in any prostate surgery? In incontinence, yeah, impotence, things like this. And so there are things we can do with fluorescence, with non-fluorescence to, to make it better. But you're, you're, you're the urologist, I have to look at you. <laughs> yes, we have yeah, Hank as well. Uh, um, but so if, and if, if we look at you know, the other big market that we serve is, is, uh, is uh, gynecology. And so some of the problems with gynecology we were discussing last night is, is ureteral injury. So if we actually take imaging agents and image the ureters, this would be a wonderful thing for people who don't know where the ureters are, some of the colorectal procedures, some of the, uh, some of the, um, the gynecologists performing these procedures. So this is how we can help. This isn't FDA approved, but we need to work on these things together to get them approved. Uh, I focus mostly on the FDA because that's my regulatory body, but I realize there are, there are other people from different regions of the world in the room. We'll talk about more about this tomorrow, but if we look at hysterectomies as an example, and we can fight about these numbers tomorrow, say there are half a million hysterectomies in the U.S., there's a very low rate of urethral injury. But when it happens, you know, five to 15,000 patients a year affected by this, the cost of complications is quite high. And the hospitals in the U.S. tend not to make a lot of money on each of these uh, procedures. So if we assume a certain penetration rate of how many, you know, we're not going to give it to every single patient. We start with 20% of the surgeries. 100,000 patient doses a year. Maybe we charge $300 per dose. If the hospital's making 1,000, $300 per dose could be reasonable. $1,000 per dose might not be reasonable. 
you make $30 million a year, which I, everyone in this room probably would jump up and down if they're making $30 million a year. But when you put the actual investments into this, pharmaceutical companies just don't care about this. They need hundreds of millions. To, you know, they want Lipitor, they want statins, they want cholesterol drugs, they want uh, you know, $200,000 chemotherapeutic agents. You know, something like this starts to get them interested at $100 million, but isn't really what they're going after. So you can discuss these numbers, but roughly you know, $50 million to get this FDA approved. And um, you know, we can argue, but in reality, no one has done it in the US for less than $75 million in recent years. And they even don't have reimbursement for those drugs yet. So if you look at something like this, you can make, you can make a better financial argument. You know, 200,000 breast cancer surgeries a year in the US. Positive margins are quite high. Um, cost of surgery, cost of recurrence, assume the same penetration rates. And you know, in modeling, you, you make things up, but these are rather interesting numbers and probably true numbers. You probably could charge $1,000 a dose if you're reducing the secondary cost of surgery. You get to $40 million a year, 2000 a dose, $80 million a year. Still not a lot of money, but better than 30 Probably a cheaper clinical trial because you've got a very high positive margin rate, and you'd have to show a reduction in this to, uh, to probably get reimbursement. So more achievable. This is some work from Laura Marku. I want to wrap up because um, you know, we're, we're on the way to coffee. If you can do this, she's at UC Davis, if you can do this with endogenous contrast rather than having to administer these external agents, it saves a lot of, uh, a lot of resources. So uh, fluorescence laser microscopy is a technique where you actually look at the fluorescence decay of uh, different endogenous compounds, collagen, elastin, uh, NAD. And so if you scan this, and we're working with some of her graduate students um, and scientists to figure out if we can actually present this to a surgeon in a nice way, looking at the lifetimes of different tissues, yeah, you know, Hank, you probably don't want to look at this, <laughs> but you know, this would probably be a little bit better in terms of determining where, where nerves, where, uh, where tumor borders lie. And so these are, these are experimental, they're promising, but when you look at this, it kind of makes sense. Hey, this is, this is exciting, you know, this is something I can actually commercialize if it works. And so we, we have a bit of, of, uh, of work to do to make sure that it actually works. Ultrasound, uh, many of you probably use ultrasound. Another example of how to translate something, you know, we're not an ultrasound company, we're a robotics company. But we saw a lot of surgeons doing partial nephrectomies where having someone stick a laparoscopic ultrasound probe in. And so we simply went to a couple of ultrasound companies and said, can you make it graspable by the robot? And sure enough, two of them, BK and Aloka, did such this. And uh, you can actually see the surgeon now has independent control of the ultrasound probe, can look for vessels, can look for tumor depth. And for us, we can start looking at some visualization techniques. You know, how do we, this is in the liver. How do we actually present this information to surgeons in a way that they understand? And you can see vessels. You'd be able to see uh, other defects, tumors. And so, you know, we wouldn't actually make the actual uh, gathered, the data gathering device, but we might be able to, to actually play around with the augmented reality aspects of it. So why do companies exist? Once again, audience participation. Make profit. Okay, that's pretty harsh, but okay. Why else? Help. What's this? Nothing else. Nothing else. Okay, just to make profit. Where everyone's evil. <laughs> Maybe to help patients, but just to make money. That's what they teach you in business school to maximize shareholder value. It's true. It's, 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 that's what they say. Companies exist to maximize shareholder value. Well, you want to help patients. You want to, if you if you do the right thing for the healthcare system, hopefully you make money and hopefully you maximize shareholder value. But if you don't help the market, you're not going to do that. You know, we're a company, and we, if you look at our finances, we, you know, people who own our stock, you know, it's like 90, 93% are investors, not you and I, but in mutual funds and people like this. So, so if we do things as a company to upset these guys, they're going to remove our management and tell us to do something else. That's the problem with being a public company. If you're a family-owned business, maybe you have the founder, uh, the founder's children to make happy. They make the decisions. For us, the investors trust our management with the money that we make to do something with it. Hopefully it's long term. Hopefully you're not thinking about next quarter. Hopefully you're thinking about five or 10 years from now. But it's something that you have to think about when you become a public company. Uh, it, it's, it's important. And if you look at you know, the revenue that we had in 2014, the gross profit and the net income, if we start spending on wacky things, things that aren't in our wheelhouse, our investors will go, what the heck are you doing? So it's, it's something that, um, that we have to pay attention to. So, to answer the question that Fige gave me, how do we translate something? How do we think uh, something might be successful? If we help the patients recover faster, and that's really where Intuitive has gotten to today is based off of uh, minimally invasive surgery, we also want to incur, cure, increase cure rates. And with hopefully some of the, the revenues that we've generated and the, the profits that we've generated, we can start funding some of these technologies that actually do real-time positive margin detection uh, with the lymph node issues that people have talked about earlier today.
Um, ultimately, we want to enable surgeons to do things that they can't do with their hands. Uh, and we, w when you look at economics, and we can have this discussion in the coffee break, you need to, you need to save the healthcare system money. And there are a lot of crit critiques about robotics being expensive, but you need to actually work out something that actually works with the healthcare system and shows that you can actually have a positive outcome. Um, and you know, if you're a company, you have to look at patents because you uh, ultimately, if you invest millions of dollars to commercialize something and someone else makes a knockoff and starts selling it, then you, uh, you really haven't done uh, justice to your company or to your investors or to patients because it probably won't be, won't be, uh, won't be accepted. So this is my contact information. Thank you again, and I'll, I'll take any questions. So 